Okay. Well, so we're gonna we're gonna have plenty of time for Q and A. We're just gonna go over some of the basic rules. Um, um, and then um, and then we'll we'll all talk. We have Heidi here who is a former awardee who can speak from that um, perspective as well as, as what it's like to navigate everything with the, the two of us and and more. Um, but I'll I'll just introduce the Frank Grouchy Further Fund. So um, this is an endowed grant program um, that supports creative arts research at Carnegie Mellon University. So it's not just even though you're in the College of Fine Arts, it's not just College of Fine Arts. This is um, a, a across the university um, grant opportunity. And so what is the studio? Oh, next slide. I'm trying to be slick about this, but we're not gonna be slick. slick. <laughs> um, <laughs> but the, the, the studio is the space you're in now, or if you're watching this in a recording, it's the space that you should come to. Um, we're, we're here in the College of Fine Arts, CFA 111 on the first floor. Um, and we are the central research laboratory of the CMU College of Fine Arts. Um, since 1989, we are dedicated to the support of atypical, anti-disciplinary, and inter-institutional research at the intersections of arts, science, technology, and culture. Uh, the Frank Ratchie Further Fund was endowed in 2013 and is administered by the studio. It's named in honor of the generosity of our benefactors, Sarah Ratchi, who was an art um, undergrad in 1983. She graduated in Ed Frank, Computer Science, 1985. So, alumni. Slide. Uh, what is the FERF? The FERF, the Frank Ratchi Further Fund, is an endowment to encourage the creation of innovative arts research by the faculty, staff, and students at Carnegie Mellon University. I say staff like that because it's one of the few grants that staff are encouraged and able to apply to. So that's really awesome. I was a former staff member who also got one too, so that's great. Um, with this fund, the studio seeks to support innovative projects created at CMU, works that can be described as thinking at the edges of the intersection of disciplines. Um, the first supports approximately 50 grants per year approximately 50k annually it's an endowment it draws differently every year um and we try to give out every single penny that we possibly can um who is eligible so primary investigators pis it's slang um must be actively affiliated with cmu so faculty pis can be tenure track teaching track adjunct or instructional faculty, special faculty, visiting faculty, et cetera. They just have to be actively teaching. So like if adjuncts have to be actively adjuncting, if that makes sense. Um, so student PIs must be currently enrolled in a degree granting program at CMU and in good st academic standing, not on probation uh, or leave of absence or suspension. So that's one thing to think about is like where where your eligibility stands in that at different times in your journey. Um, staff are eligible. Um, so are project scientists, research staff, visiting scholars, postdoctoral researchers, et cetera, from any CMU department. We we reach across um, you know the campus and parts of the campus that don't even seem like the campus where there are staff researchers in many different areas who are also creative researching people. Um, and we, we are lucky to meet them through this further fund. Um, more unusual entities are also eligible. Collaborations, teams, clubs, student organizations, faculty on behalf of a class, entire departments, visiting artists. Um, you know, if you have any questions about where, whether your unusual entity is eligible, you can always reach out to Harrison Apple or next to me. Um, alumni cannot be PIs because the alumni part means not actively affiliated. But if you are an alumni who works at CMU, you are affiliated. Um, and we have many of those in the room. Um, must You must have completed documentation of any previous FERC award. So if you have gotten a further fund in the past, you must complete it. And the way we know you have completed it is not just you spent all your money, but you sent us the documentation to show that something happened. 
and it goes on our website, so it should be really pretty. Mm -hmm. um, what is eligible? The FERP aims to be the most flexible source of project support at CME. It can be used to help realize at a non-exhaustive list, just some examples, um, independent arts research and investigations, arts research and investigations that have additional sources of funding. Matching funds is great and often what will make something happen. <laughs> um, arts research projects with CMU or outside collaborators, undergraduate and graduate thesis projects, classwork, class projects, final projects. We're at an academic institution and where creative research is best supported often is a classroom. Um, less commonly, equipment for the sake of equipment. So I'm really into that doodad that just came out. Boy, oh boy, do I wanna do something cool. I don't know what, but I wanna to touch that doodad. That's not really what the further fun is for. Um, but I bet at CNU you can convince somebody to buy a doodad. Um, pretty easy around here. Uh, ambitious, impractical, and improbable projects. Totally cool. Um, startup funding for independent collaboratives. Um, you know, if you're if you're starting something and you just have a project that defines that collaboration, that's what I would explain as a startup funding for independent collaboratives, not just to like. Um, paying a lawyer to make your 501c3 would, would, if that was attached to a project, yes. If it's not attached to a project, might not be as strong of an application. Um, yeah. So performances, installations, books, software, films, games, product designs, community projects, interventions, workshops, exhibitions, more. I really encourage you to go to this website and it used to have a different acronym and we can't change the link, it's okay, but um, we'll still call it FERP. Um, you can still find it from our homepage. And if you look at the projects, and which is an example of the documentation that you would be submitting after you finish your award, um, that is where you can see what jur the jury has selected in the past. So FERC micro grants um, are uh, $500 or under by definition, must be spent in six months um, and are decided by me, the director. Um, and, and we do it in that lightweight way because it's done on a rolling basis and um, we're able to respond more quickly with these micro grants. Um, so they're not just for students, uh, micro grants are available to any person who is actively affiliated with CMU, just like the full grants. Um, and they're made available to assist projects that require just a little nudge. Um, and, and, you know, all, all, often they're also supplied to projects that, you know, are on their way to a full grant, but they just need like a little bit of um, proof or, you know, um, a prototype or, you know, something that will strengthen um, the evidence to the jury that it, what you're doing is something that you are really doing, you know? And so it's often um, something that will offer somebody who's at the beginnings of an idea or in development um, to say, you know, it sounds like you just need a little bit of money to like push from development, push from concept to prototype, to be able to say like, hey, I'm gonna build a floating sky pool, you know? And, and it's like, cool, can you build a mini floating sky pool to show us how it's gonna float? Um, and then we all get to go to the pool party later. Uh, so it's just really hot outside, so I'm imagining being in a pool. Um, great, and also just to say, you know, the fun does run out over the years, so like, at the very end of the spring semester, a micro grant is less likely to be able to achieve <laughs> because we are going to have two full grant rounds. We try to keep some money on hand at the end of the spring one, but also if there's like 50 applications that we really want to fund, it might be harder to get, you know, that like $500 thing that would help you apply in the fall. So just think about timing, um, end of the year, the funds are running dry, but they will refill in July. So know that. Um, 
Yeah, the smallest micro grant ever was ten dollars. So you don't have to apply for five hundred dollars exactly. If if you're if if you need like two hundred and forty two dollars and thirty two cents, then tell us that's how much you need. <laughs> um, full grants. So full grants are the big ones. They're five hundred and one dollars to five thousand dollars, and and we stop at five thousand dollars so that we can disperse as much money as possible. Um, from the endowment. So these are available to any person actively affiliated with PMU, whether they are student faculty or staff. Um, selected in two rounds, the fall, which is coming up, um, and then the spring. These must be spent in 12 months. And the reason why we do this is, is because a big deciding factor, and we'll repeat this in another slide, is um, timeline on um, you know, is that it does this thing need to be funded now? Um, because that that really defines a hierarchy of need when we're looking at projects. It's not like every single project has a timeline or or has some urgency to it, but it, you know, we can look at applications, or at least we hope to be able to see in applications. Is this person ready to make? It? Are they going to do this right now? And why we do the twelve months is so that we keep this money going. We do not like to stagnate. We like this money to move and go to creative research. That is our goal. We want to give it out and we want it to be spent a lot of it, all the time. <laughs> um, it's selected by a five member advisory jury um, that's comprised of me. Um, and so that's why you should talk to Harrison because I'm on the jury. Harrison can be more helpful to you than I can. Be. Um, and then also the head of the School of Art a CFA faculty member not from ART, a C CMU faculty member not from the CFA, and a non-CMU Pittsburgh arts professional um, who generally change each session. Um, the next deadline is Sunday, September 24th, 2023 at 11.59 p.m. Um, and the spring deadline, if you're like, oh, maybe I'm not ready for this, think about the spring deadline. It is February 11th. 2024, we do our best to like evenly distribute the funds across the year so that you don't feel some kind of urgency to say, I gotta get in on the fall because it's when all the money is there. Just, you know, if you're not ready, if you get that award and then you're not ready to spend it in 12 months, you might not get to spend all that money, <laughs> you know? So think about your time. Um, the application is online. Um, Harrison did a great job of simplifying the website and the application, so it should be ready for you to apply. Um, how are awards selected? So, um, you know, oh, I mentioned a couple things, um, but, you know, vision, originality, you can be loosey-goosey with that word, but basically, like, you know, looking for research that is um, pushing something forward, isn't repeating something, or if it's repeating something, it's a really interesting typology that we might discover something out of, I don't know. Um, but also quality is really important and potential impact of the proposed project. Um, the professional, artistic, and or technical capabilities of the applicant. So meaning like, can, can they do the thing that they're saying they're gonna do? Have they ever built a floating pool, um, you know, or something that resembles that? Has, have they made anything float, you know? Um, so if you've made something float, tell us in your application so we believe that you can float again. Um, I really hope someone actually applies with this project. Uh, the feasibility of the project goes back to this like capability. Um, the feasibility is also, you know, reflected in the budget. I will say that yeah, I'm a former production manager. I do look at budgets. I'm just gonna clue you in the budget is where I go. <laughs> and that and that tells me, like, have you thought this through? You know, a budget can define, like, oh, I do know a person who can do this or that. I do, you know, I've, I've thought about where that thing is going to be or that materiality or, you know, all of those different things can be reflected in the budget. And we have a template that I created to, like, sh show you what I what I think is important to see in a, bu a budget that's also on the website. Um, but also the proximity, proximity of needs, so describing your timeline, describing, you know, like even if it isn't an urgent project, describing like, I want to make this now because, you know, the stars have aligned in a certain way 
but this is when I can do it and I want to do it. So, you know, put, put me out there. Um, and then the potential impact of our support on the project and for the artists. So like, you know, is this fundable by many other things? Um, have, have you exhausted options? Um, are you doing something that's just so bizarre that no one else believes that it should exist in the world? <laughs> you might wanna apply for a further phone. <laughs> um, you know, like, or or have you applied and you have matching funds and this is this is going to seal the deal for you. You know, like the, I'm applying for $2,500 because that's gonna get us to that place. Um, and then the extent to which the proposed work pushes the arm. So this is our mission with this is, you know, fulfilling the specific mission of the FERC grant pro pro program to support innovative interdisciplinary arts that challenge conventions. And then how competitive is FERC? So the FERC is an endowed grant program within, within an educational institution. Um, and as we've said many times, you know, that means the people who are eligible are here at CMU. So, you know, it's not a big, huge public grant. So that's one note on competitiveness. Um, for many, um, especially for students, the FERC will be the very first award on their CV. Um, and so we are at an educational institution. We do support students in applying for this grant and we support staff and we support faculty. You know, no shame if this is your first grant application, no matter what position you're in. Um, but, you know, we're in this school. We will support you in applying to this. And, you know, um, I suggest heavily making an appointment with, with Harrison Apple before applying, um, even if you're the best grant writer in the universe, you know, like take, take the opportunity to talk to someone who's in on every single meeting we have. Here's the feedback from the jury, sees every single application that comes in, knows like where to find the gaps in information that we will need, you know, quickly and in the meeting um, in order to determine how feasible it is, when it's happening, where it's happening, et cetera. Because that's the information we need. It's not, it's not mysterious information. Um, it's just like, what, what? what? <laughs> it's a lot of like, huh? What? Hello? Um, so it's also, you know, it's just more competitive to get higher grants. You know, you can see this language, but basically it is harder to get a get more money than it is to get less money. Um, and so, you know, if you are applying for a big chunk of money, if you're applying for $5,000, you know, what we see is we see 50 amazing projects and we see, you know, as so many things that we want to happen. And if, you know, somebody's like, well, and then I need the biggest chunk of the pie. You really, so why do you really, really need that? And and it's not that we haven't done it. We've done it, but you know, it it's not always done. So now I'll turn over to Harrison. Do you want to see this? I mean, boy, do I? But what happened here? Here's another thing. Uh, um. Yeah, so uh, in the event that you are awarded uh, your proposed project and budget from the further fund, there are a lot of questions about how it can be spent, what it can be spent on. And generally speaking, our rule is that you can buy anything legally, but uh, where we can offer a lot of advice is how to do it uh, in a way that's helpful to you, that is timely, that will keep you from incurring uh, tax liability, these sorts of things that are the minutia of working with money that is wrapped up in a university. And some of this has to do with whether or not you are a faculty, staff, or student. So uh, going down the list here, uh, you can spend your award through the studio. In fact, we highly recommend it because we can purchase things with our uh, tax-free uh, purchasing power. We can have things delivered safely here for you. We can handle um, issues with suppliers and tracking, all of the stuff that makes it harder for you to just get the object or whatever service that you need. Um, Hey, uh, so purchasing equipment is uh, one of the typical things that people are often out uh, to get, but paying for outside services is where it's really helpful to be able to rely on the studio's experience. Trying to pay for any service at Carnegie Mellon requires the central office to create a contract with this service provider. This includes student labor, this includes uh, any vendor who is not simply selling you a good, um, and that can take quite a lot of time. So as you're proposing your uh, 
grants to us, I might step in to say it would be a great thing for you to be able to outline what the service request is. I can even put this in through our business manager ahead of time so that in the event that you are awarded this grant, the vendor is in the system. You can actually pay for these things rather than potentially waiting for up to a month or more. Mm -hmm. um, usually what this has to do with is that, I don't know who's uh, had ex this experience, mm -hmm. but um, dealing with the maybe seven people who run accounts payable for the entire university means that they go through thousands of invoices every single day for every university campus, uh, including Rwanda, Qatar, and here in Pittsburgh. So it's just, uh, it's an overwhelming amount of material and we've become much better at trying to push your material faster but uh, there is a certain amount of time that uh, it just takes. So we try to get you ahead of that. The existence of bureaucracy here. Yeah. And, and we'll do a little slower than you personally paying with your debit card at a checkout counter. It just will. <laughs> yeah, it's it's just true. And we know how to get around certain things. You know, we know that you can't purchase anything like 75 miles outside of Pittsburgh with a P card. But if you can fake it, you can make it. Um, you know, there are certain uh, thresholds that are available for us to try to make these things move faster. One of them that is very difficult to move any faster is hiring students. Um, and one of the tricky things we find is that a lot of applicants have already had students do labor, which they intend to reimburse them for. And in the instance that you hire a student for their labor, you are required to create a position for them to have them log hours through workday. And only then through the position, which is expected to have a certain number of hours per week, usually about 15, so that they don't hit the benefit cap, uh, are you allowed to pay them? So- And not retroactively. Not retroactively. I mean, you cannot retroactively ask somebody to log hours for work that they definitely didn't already do, but they will have to log those hours and be paid accordingly. And you will have to swear up and down that they are doing the work then. There is just no way to do that kind of reimbursement just otherwise. Work closely with Linda Hager and Harrison Apple is what I will just say. Just meet with them, talk to them, work with them, follow the rules with them, do do the things, fill out the paperwork. Right. This also goes for hiring other staff and faculty who have to be uh, paid through activity payments, and this incurs a tax liability. But um, come to us with those particular questions. There's no point in going to the deep, deep depths of it today. Um, bringing guests and collaborators outside of uh, school, again, requires some sort of contract or speaker agreement. And uh, we can help you with the ins and outs of reimbursements for things like business meals, for uh, food, for workshops, and uh, exhibition hors d'oeuvres, any sort of catering that you work with. It's more complicated than we would like it to be, but we will help you solve this problem. And uh, expenses for travel are not that complicated, but they are um, filled with strange rules. Ta uh, receipts for reimbursement after 90 days count as taxable income. Uh, if you want to be reimbursed for gas, it's best to show us a, you have to send us a Google map of the entire route, uh, the exact mileage and uh, any toll receipts for us to be able to get you kind of the best deal on gas reimbursement. And all of that said, uh, the only real rule in the uh, entire grant that is, says you cannot buy this is you cannot pay for conference travel. You can pay for travel that is essential to the research, but it cannot be uh, anything related to attending a an academic conference. This precedes both Nika and I, and it cannot be changed. It's in the, it's in the gift. Yeah. Um, I will also just say, note that when purchasing supplies for the studio, they will be tax-free. So if we look at your budget and they are not tax-free, you know, we will have to do our own math. And I think it's best if you do your math when asking for the amount you need. This so is consider looking at educational pricing for equipment, especially software. Um, consider looking at what would this cost without the taxes, et cetera. And I'll make these recommendations to you when you send in a draft of your application or meet with me. Um, as we're looking at what you're actually doing, we go from a universe of possible uh, obstacles and mistakes to a very discrete list. And that's just so much more fun to work with, isn't it? I think so. So um, there are instances in which the FERC awards can be directly deposited, but this is pretty much exclusive to students and, um, and reimbursements for receipts for faculty and staff. Students uh, that are applying, uh, are able to receive the entire reward as a direct deposit and that they purchase those materials on their own. But one of the things that I will talk with you about is making sure that you are aware that you are liable for that um, award as income. So it goes into your next year's tax return. But also uh, if you are an international student or if you are simply not a US citizen, 
the uh, tax burden is extremely high and you do not have to receive this award as a direct deposit. So the studio can work with you just like any other faculty member or staff member to make sure that you don't take on a completely undue burden and essentially lose upwards of 18% of your award money to the US government and the extremely conservative uh, CMU central office. Um, we talked a bit about reimbursements for expenses, and I want to also say that it's possible to be reimbursed for purchases that you had already made prior to applying, as long as it is in fact part of the same project and the justification is clear in the budget. Again, things that we can in a very quiet meeting just sit down and do together. Uh, the first, of course, is cash, and that's the most exciting part for most people. And I would agree. I really like money. I think it's super helpful in a capitalist society. But there are lots of other ways that we help you. Uh, as I've talked about, way, you know, finding your way through the many rules and regulations that CMU is forced to work with, uh, making sure you're in compliance with those kinds of rules, but also trying to assist you in your project's next steps. So if we think about where the FERF is in the scale of available funding for creative research in the College of Fine Arts generally, we're pretty low in the amounts of money you can eventually apply for, especially as it concerns faculty. So getting a micro grant towards a full grant and producing you know, the early formative stages of a large project would catapult you towards Jen Joy Wilson's office on the exact other side of this building. Hopefully not literally, there's a lot of marble columns in the way and she can find you tens of thousands of dollars potentially. And working with sponsored projects office across the hallway can start to find you private foundation money or um, government funds that will turn the scale of your work from something that is very much more like a prototype to a um, freestanding, potentially independent, uh, you know, work that can sustain itself for years to come. And I'll just say, like, just how our micro grant can be, you know, prove make something out of that to prove that you can make something larger, make something larger. Like the fur often operates that way. I, I had that experience of starting with a further fund and then going over to Jen Joy's office and getting a, a larger amount of money and being able to complete a project to a, a much larger extent, much more finished extent, um, because this was my first. Day. And then I, I got two further funds here, and then I got a grant through Jen Joy's office. So, you know, don't stop. Go, go. <laughs> I, Nick and I had a similar experience. Um, my in my last year as a student, I received uh, in the first year of awards from the firm for an exhibition, uh, an experimental exhibition about LGBTQ history in the city, and that led toward a Pittsburgh Foundation grant to produce, you know, uh, not just uh, the catalog for the exhibit, but creating the, you know, the beginnings of the community archives that I still operate. And so all of these things are really easy to move along scale in the CMU universe. Um, and the other kinds of assistance that we often can provide that people use regularly is using the space itself. So if you're working on a FERF project that demands some sort of demonstration or space to practice or space to work with our bizarre library of equipment, the studio is available to you. And likewise, the studio hires several undergraduate workers, some of whom are responsible for keeping the space open, safe, available, teaching people how to use equipment correctly. But also we hire a staff videographer every year um, and usually that person hangs on for quite a while and they become extremely adept at documenting your uh, materials with you, which as we all know, documenting your own work is absolutely the worst part, or so I feel. And it's very lovely to have someone show up with a camera who's just extremely comfortable with that device. They know the ins and outs of making something look lovely and then editing it for you as well. Um, it's best to include this in the budget itself, yes. but it is <laughs> something that you can ask us about during the uh, original consultation. And then I can tell you that, you know, we should think about for something uh, this style, X number of hours at whatever rate. Yes. People people get paid. Yeah, the studio doesn't like people to do things for free. No. So no. if anybody here asks you to do that, they don't work here. <laughs> um, the grant process is uh, relatively simple. You should make an appointment with myself so we can look at exactly what you want to do and I can help keep you uh, as pain-free as possible. Um, students absolutely have to secure a faculty advisor for their project. There is a form on the website, a very lovely one-page website with no dead links or labyrinths or random pages that you have to cycle through anymore. And you just send that to your advisor who essentially checks a box that says, yes, I do know this person, they are not lying. Um, and it is restricted to their Andrew ID email, so it would be way more money or trouble than it's worth to fake this. Um, and a short description of how you understand the student's work, what it is about it that you endorse. And this goes to the jury to be read aloud and move hearts and minds. 
And it's also because we can't, like, I don't have the bandwidth to advise every single student who walks in. Um, and, and so making sure that you have an advisor who is aware of your project, can speak to you about your project, and like make some time so that you're not abandoned with this giant, wonderful idea. You know, it's just so important to every student who's navigating academia. Yeah, it's difficult to balance uh, your, you know, degree granting timeline and a project that may or may not fit into your coursework or your qualifications for your mm -hmm. degree. Um, so the studio can support you and try to make that less burdensome, but you do need an actual advisor, someone who is supposed to be close to the, you know, perhaps the overlapping disciplines where your project exists. Um, you would, uh, after meeting with me and making sure that you have an advisor, if you are a student applicant, submit your online application. I highly recommend drafting the whole thing out in a Word document or a Google Doc because the application is itself a Google form and it um, forces you to be pushed through a couple of different entries. And so just having that stuff ready to copy and paste is very helpful. Um, in the case of a micro grant, I find that when we are at our absolute best, you might get a response in one week. And with the juried application, uh, the timeline has been spelled out for you a bit. We have the deadline for the fall one on September 24th. The jury will meet on October 10th. And I do my very best to get the award letters out either the day that the jury decides or if the jury is meeting later than usual, the day afterward. But you will get an email directly from myself, CCing um, Nika as well as our business manager, informing you of the results of their decision and the next steps for uh, your particular application. And once you've... Uh, you know, just bask in the glow of an award from such a prestigious institution, you need to make an appointment with our business manager, Linda Hager, whose office is <laughs> uh, just, it, please don't wait. I can't explain. You know how it's like when people don't do their paperwork and they don't get paid and then they email you like, where's my money? This is what happens. It's constant. So often. I just really like getting paid. <laughs> so Linda will have you sign a FERF agreement that is all the things you will have already read. It says that you will complete the project as proposed. You will inform us of any significant changes. You will provide documentation of the project, um, which you can submit through the website, simple link, all on the same page. And also that whenever you present that work publicly, you will acknowledge that it was made possible in part by funding from the Frank Ratchy Studio for Creative Inquiry and the Frank Ratchy Further Fund. Simple kind of stuff. And these wonderful people will email you and remind you. <laughs> yeah, I have this really sexy spreadsheet where it says everything that you've ever applied for and when you were given these funds and okay. whether or not you've filled out my lovely form. Yeah, I, I briefly did my, my grad school work in library science. So just like relational <laughs> database looking at you is wonderful. Uh, we no. could be. I don't know. Thank you for that. Um, <laughs> this is something that uh, we can both speak to, but you'll see this in the application and sometimes boggles people because it's not a part of every single grant. Um, whether or not this is your first grant uh, application, you should know that every granting institution is a little bit different. And this one is really important for us. With the full grants, you're going to, um, well, this actually works for both. Uh, the grant application for micros and full grants is the same form. It's the same questions. It's just a matter of scale. Um, but it's particularly important for something as competitive as a full grant because it allows us to understand what is it that you need to do the um, smallest scale version of this particular active research and what would make it its ideal scale if you could have everything that you needed. And that justification can be written directly into your budget. It's something that the jury looks at very closely and takes truly to heart to think about how much more compelling and much, how much greater impact would this work have if it were able to be granted its full budget. So making that range as uh, demonstrate as clear as can be demonstrated and as um, as broad as is reasonable um, allows us to do two things. One, make sure that your research can be done to the effect that it serves you and the community that uh, is affected by your research or your work, as well as making sure that we can spread these funds as far as possible and fund as many projects as we can. Is there anything you wanted to say more? Just an example would be like, I need to work, I, I'm doing a motion capture project. And, you know, I ha I'm hiring, I want to hire two dancers, you know, and, it, and you say, well, I want to hire these two dancers because they move very differently. They have very different bodies. And, you know, it's really important to have that capture in the skeletal video. Um, but, you know, what the project is trying to do is trying to demonstrate this certain type of movement. And like, I could do it with one of the dancers. I could show this type of movement that this dancer knows and this other dancer knows um, with 
with one dancer and that would be my so you know like say you're paying the dancers five hundred dollars each you know that would be a five hundred dollar difference or maybe it's including traveling like maybe they're very specialized movement people who live elsewhere you know like that could be a major difference you know that could be a whole flight and a hotel and all of that so you know that would be an example of maximum that's helpful um, and then comes the fun news. What happens if my application is rejected? Blah, blah. It does happen, sad to say. But um, please apply again, because the reason that your application is not accepted, which I like a lot better than rejected, if you do ask me, uh, is not necessarily a reflection of the quality of your work. Sometimes it's just a matter of there is a limited pool of funds and the people who were awarded their grants have a much stricter timeline. The work is prioritized because of a deadline or a schedule. Perhaps somebody is plan you know, a visiting faculty member and this is their last year to produce this work or somebody is graduating. We try to take that into account because it suggests that the opportunity should be fairly distributed according mm -hmm. to people's access to the grant itself. Um, you can, of course, make an appointment with me and I will um, reflect some of what the jury is able to say um, without, you know, identifying who the members themselves are uh, and um, trying to make it as useful to you as possible. If there's anything in your application that should or can be changed, if there is um, an understanding that it was simply a matter of timing and a lack of funds to fund every single project, I can encourage you very, very discreetly to apply immediately again. Um, and there are, of course, those problems that uh, are more about the application itself. Sometimes a, an application that's submitted simply isn't that very, isn't well explained. Um, if you hadn't had a chance to run a draft by me and you submitted it a bit blind, uh, you might have found that areas of the questions are uh, a bit redundant and they say a lot about one section but fail to help us understand, does it serve the mission of the grant itself? is the budget outlined by items, but there's no links to the materials that you wish to purchase. So we can't verify that what you're saying you wish to purchase costs as much as it does. Um, sometimes there's logistical issues that we find haven't been considered, whether or not it's possible to move a person from one part of the world to another as part of your grant, whether or not it is possible because of uh, CMU's uh, legal apparatus that you can't pay for materials that are produced by one country rather than another. These are sorts of things that are handed down to us in a bizarre flood of emails that I receive almost daily. And I do my best to send them to you and say, oh no, you actually can't buy surveillance technology from China. CMU will not allow you to do that. And I can't just give you the money knowing that you're going to do it because they will, uh, they will do more than yell at me and you will never see me again. Maybe. I don't know. <laughs> but the, um, they just took it away. They, well, that's all. It's pretty bad too. <laughs> Uh, and um, likewise, sometimes people uh, with the budget, it's the last thing that they produce and they don't give it the, uh, the time to consider whether or not they need to ask for the range of funds that they have. Often we've seen projects that request funds that are simply putting them in a competitive uh, bracket that is unnecessary for them to accomplish the work that they want to do. And so if they say that my minimum budget is $4,000 and we can't interpret for them that you can in fact do this with $1,500, um, we, we can't in good faith award that. We can make you, occasionally we will see a grant that applies for a full, cannot be um, awarded by the jury, but we believe that something uh, important towards that research could be accomplished with a micro grant and might offer that as a option in the, um, in the rejection letter or perhaps funds from a different um, pot because it may not fit the mission or the rules. So some people have applied what for projects that are really about producing a platform. A, another institute, you know, a small, grassroots institution to distribute funds to other artists would be an example of something that we sometimes see applications for, but cannot be awarded by the firm itself. But that might be something that we could award through another pot of money like the director's fund. Um, so all that's to say rejection is certainly not the end for any application at the firm, And uh, we're happy to guide you back to, you know, receiving lots of funds for your beautiful creative research. Yeah. And, and when we're looking through grants, we're also thinking about what other resources we know about um, and we try to provide that and feedback, whether you're rejected or not. Um, even sometimes if you get the award, we'll say, you know, so-and-so is over there and they're doing some stuff and they got some research from them too. You should go talk to them. You know, like we try to, we try to keep um, aware of other opportunities um, that could be a part of this project. Um, I will also say that, you know, Harrison gave an example of like, asking for too much i would say also something is like asking for too little like if, if it just really doesn't seem like you could possibly do the thing and and you're like it's only gonna cost ten dollars and it's like well 
you know, like that, that can also be improbable to the Um, so can projects be repeatedly fun, funded? Yes, absolutely. And we highly encourage it because it, you know, helps us to watch you on a journey of building this work up. And it happens um, to be quite easy to go through this process because you are essentially being trained to receive a certain amount of uh, funds for your project, being forced to produce documentation in order to apply for another one and be eligible and do that uh, up to two times at the scale of a full grant. So what that means is that a project could, in theory, be funded three times, starting with a micro grant, followed by a full grant, followed by another. Um, granted, you must be here probably for about um, two and a half years for that to be virtually possible, probably much longer. Documentation. It's just not going to be that hard because I will chase it down. I have a, a folder that's just called Shakedown, and it's <laughs> everybody's folder. Um, and the great thing about this uh, material is that, yeah, you you basically are writing your next grant through the documentation of your uh, of your pre of your prior one, and you, you can meet with me as many times as you want. Uh, I, I have a long history of writing grants uh, in my own practice. I'm happy to help you revise if writing is not your strong suit, if it's something that makes you nervous, if it's just a matter of needing another ear, and everybody in your life, professionally or otherwise, is busy. I'm happy to read your writing. I promise not to make fun of you. To your face. You cannot be the lead applicant on uh, two grants um, at the same time. So uh, while you can be receiving funding for a project multiple times, you can only be the PI for one. So you can be um, involved in more than one, but you simply can't be uh, applying for one while you still have one that's not uh, completed by submitting documentation. That said, um, we found that something that the FIRF has started to produce and we would like to encourage through perhaps uh, a series of uh, larger programming in the spring is that the FERF becomes its own kind of creative and intellectual cohort. You start to meet other people who have received FERF awards and learn from their own their research, whether or not it overlaps very clearly with your own, thinking about if the scale of their project matches the scale of yours, what funding sources are they looking for for the next step? Um, are they working with vendors that you might be able to use who offer similar or even just parallel services? And um, that's part of the reason that I really wanted Heidi to be here today, so that when we finally finish this section of the presentation, she can tell you about her experience. Um, you already know that documentation for prior projects must be submitted before you can apply for any others. Um, and you should know that the jury will uh, have access to prior documentation of your project. So it's not enough to submit documentation. It really ought to be good. Um, you know, it is a sense of a uh, proof of what you were able to do. And if you send us something that even you don't want to look at, just imagine what it looks like to five people who have seen this stuff before. And also it's the only thing we have of yours. And what if you make a book? And that's that's what's in there. You know, what if you make an exhibition? It has happened, and that's what's in it. 30 you years know? of really proud people. You know? Yeah. Could be 60 years from now. Who know. So that's all to say, the documentation is a requirement, but let it also be a, a call to create this quality work. Um, there are lots of other funding sources at the university, and I'm happy to help you find them. It's especially difficult to do this when you are enmeshed in your full-time job here. So here is a um, non-exhaustive list of some of them that are available. Some of these are specific to graduate students, some specific to undergrads, and some are open to all. I will say that I do my best to make sure that the links that they have provided to us don't die. And if they do, that they have put them back up. But I cannot guarantee that they will do that at the timeline that I would like. For instance, I right before this presentation, double checked that OLR had opened up the um, Art Supply Fund, which is great for undergraduate students who are needing extra funds to finish a project at the end of a course. Um, they have simply not opened up their uh, fund for this year, but they do provide an email which you can contact. So that will be available. I will also say if you are considering applying with an XR related creative project, I really want to encourage you and it's on our website, um, the XRTC creative research grant is, is there for you. Like you should be submitting to that as well as to this, you know, try your luck on both. Um, I'm not discouraging you from applying to the firm, but I want you to know there's a whole nother bucket of money. And this is its first year, so all bets are off. Everybody is, you know, just, oh, we'd be so excited to read your application. And you can apply for between one and $6,000, uh, roughly, uh, which is, you know, at, at least a grand over what you can even possibly dream with the full award from the firm. 
I will also say that um, I will talk with you about this during your consultation, but having any sort of matching funding or even the knowledge that you are applying for additional funds only serves to help your application. It will never harm your chances to say that you are also looking for funds from somewhere else. The jury will look at that and understand that you are serious about what you are trying to accomplish and that it may cost the first fund a little bit less in the end, which would allow us to place that money back into the funding pool and you know basically support more and more research, which is still core to the mission. Yeah, something important to say is that if you don't spend your whole fund, all, your whole, whole award, let us know and we'll just put it back in the pot. Like you can't apply it to a different project than what you were awarded for. You can't say, well, that's my money and I'm gonna do what I want with it. It's for the project you apply for. If you have finished the project, if you receive tons and tons of funds for the coolest project ever, put it back in the pot so that we can fund another project. That said, students can get away with this by receiving their own entire award as a direct deposit and never talking to us again. I mean, obviously never funded again, but that's yeah, part of the deal. Um, and uh, to that effect, we have, uh, it is absolutely taxable, so <laughs> like that. The, uh, something that we've made a point to um, uh, emphasize during your first meeting with Linda as an awardee is that you must spend your grant down within six months for the micro grants and 12 months for the full grant. We count the month starting after you learn. Yes. You don't count before you learn and are able to spend. So when, you know. It's, yeah, it, it's it's a reasonable uh, timeline. It doesn't start the day that you receive November. a letter that you have been awarded this funds. We wanna make sure that you actually have access to them. That said, you cannot sit on them for over a year um, and expect us not to say, uh, well, this is essentially a misuse of the mission, uh, of the funds for this mission of the grant. And it's okay, you can apply it again. If, if, if you take the money back because you didn't spend it because life happened, you can apply again. Yeah, and it's it's happened multiple times. Oftentimes, it's a matter that somebody was awarded a grant and they found that what they really needed was developmental research before they started spending on the materials for prototyping. It's a typical thing. It doesn't hurt your chances of applying again either. In fact, the honesty is appreciated. Bye, Golan. Bye. Thank you to Golan Levin, who's really responsible for this fun being here. Love you. Okay, a applaud on the website. Submit documentation. Make an appointment with Harrison. Um, and yeah, when in doubt, speak from us. So we, uh, I, I want to say just because we're getting to 620 and I want to be respectful yeah. of everyone's time, especially Heidi's, I thought we might move to you and join the Q&A together so that those answers can be supported for everybody. Is there anything you want to... The project that I had funded most recently by, well, I keep wanting to say, keep wanting to say her back, but. Oh yeah. Her, her, her. <laughs> it, because of these funds, it allowed me to travel and the project in particular, which I actually need to submit documentation for, but I do have documentation and text and a video that I can share and will share. And it's on my social media and my collaboratives social media, but we run into a lot of issues with funding because we're a collaborative group. We've just been, we want to pay everyone the big wages. We want to have everyone travel. And in this case, we were lucky to have funds from the Mid-Atlantic Arts Association. So we had like separate funds, which I know is always nice to have in, the, in to complement the others because that's a limited number. And then we were able to pull from another collaborator's pool. And so it was like, I kept dreaming. I was like, I hope the- well, It was this, very clear. Yeah. in your application like your budget was clear it was clear that it was clear that you had multiple resources and that you were going to do it. like i read the application i was like just you know and the thing is is that then it becomes like and and we want to be a part of it you know like that's also the other side of it it's like she's going to do this there's all these like entities that are you know investing in your work like let us be a part of it and I'm realizing I've been hearing this talk that I should come to you sooner because this project in particular was taking us to Dakar, Senegal. It was a big group. We also had a bunch of performers we were paying in Senegal. It's a huge, huge lift. And we're sort of like, oh my God, where, where can we find this like, extra bit of money that will push it to a place where we can actually support the whole project? Yeah. So I'm like, cheerleader for this entity. And I'm like, oh gosh, there's a thing based on the hallway that I could go to ask more questions. Art is not volunteerism. 
<laughs> and and there's no one here that believes that. So you know when when we see the the applications, we want to see a budget that does not assume you know that somebody is going to volunteer their creative labor. Thank you. <laughs> I mean, that's huge. I think that that's, that's a scary part of the process is doing, like I come from a place where that was, the funds were not available and I'm also staff, but so I'm not, I'm not faculty and I'm not a student. So this is a really unique opportunity because I'm also an artist creating work in the world and finding opportunities like this is rare at institutions, similar institutions, research one institutions. It's very hard. So this is a real gift of funds and support. So I highly recommend applying at whatever tier is appropriate. Thank you. So should we open it up to yeah. questions? Yeah, any questions? I can pass the mic around so that we all hear. Don't be shy. I, mean, yeah. I, I would love a mic that um, the ACs are just white. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for fantastic, great, thorough, extensive presentation. Um, I came maybe five minutes later. You might have missed the most important part. Of the week. Uh, what is the mission of the grant that would help? And then, um, if you had any um, uh, anything on your website on the kind of projects that have been awarded, uh, uh, you know, some examples of fun uh, of projects that received funding. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So you can see the, the mission of the FERC here up on the screen. Um, and for those of you watching the recording, it should be shared right across the entirety of your iPad. Um, but the, the FERC is interested in you know supporting works that could be described at, excuse me? There's another screen. Oh. oh, okay, wonderful. Yeah, it's interested in supporting boundary pushing research, things that are demonstrated to be at the edges of certain disciplines, that is work that is investigating a known unknown. It's not, um, for example, finishing funds for a project that is already completed. It's kind of course of research. It is truly a creative research grant. I know that it's not common for um, the university system to treat the colleges of fine arts as having a research practice or to understand that um, a laboratory might exist in a way that doesn't appear in the, you know, the sort of uh, PR of laboratories, the um, Bunsen burners and large beautiful glassware. But uh, that is what the studio operates as, and it's the, the work that we like to support. We know that it happens in every uh, school under the college, um, but the ability to find funds to support that work is difficult. So the, the FERF is for supporting these kinds of works. But the um, uh, you were asking how the awards are uh, evaluated? Oh. The, the website has documentation of all these projects, and, and what you'll notice is that they're extremely diverse. Um, and, and I think that that's one of the great benefits of this award is that it isn't describing a thing. Our mission doesn't describe your project. Um, but I would say that um, one thing that I think is, is, is somewhat true for most projects is that they're more of a question than a finished object. You know, so this is for research more than it is for finishing um, 12 new pieces in the same style that you have been working in to finish the series exactly the same thing that you've been doing, that you already did the research. It's not like that work didn't come out of research and didn't come out of nowhere, but maybe you're at a point where you want to ask a new question or push yourself in a different direction. So like um, one example being, uh, a, a person who is applying to learn a new skill um, and, and saying like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna push my entire practice in this whole different way and I need to learn how to make metal things. And I've been a textile artist for ever and I'm gonna apply for a micro grant to take class, for example. And I just thought I would jump in and say the project that I just completed in May was an experimental theater piece with a bunch of students that we just dropped into the city and were introduced to them and the materials of the place and we executed it. Now there are lots of partnerships in advance to like set up the foundation and relationships, but it was totally experimental. And we just had, I mean, and, and it, documentation is so important because so many things happen in the serendipitous way. Serendipitous way, so it's like having the ability to capture, which is why like 
I think it's sometimes hard in a process piece to have the thanks documentation where we're like, oh my God, some of our collaborations and our best work is done when we're not expecting it. So always having the camera there is super, super important, but it's like, and I think that on our scale, it's highly experimental. Yeah. And you supported that work. Yeah. And, and I mean, what I also hear in that is that not only were there questions, but there were own unknowns. So what are the unknowns in your project? What are the questions in the project? Um, I had the same question, but I do have another question. Um, and it's kind of a logistical one. I know you can't get two active awards in the same, you know, you can't have two active awards, but can you, um, do you recommend applying for both a micro and a full because um, in the same year or in the same season of the grant? If you feel like you're at the place for a micro, then apply for a micro and finish the micro and then apply for the full. You're, you're, you know, your application will be stronger if if that's what, if, if all you need is a little bit to start, that also gives you six more months, that gives you $500 more, you know, and then in the end, like you're just eligible for three things for that project rather than just two. So if you're at a place where like 500 bucks would get you somewhere and, and that would help you, then my advice would be to apply for a mic if that felt like it could get you somewhere in six months. Yeah, no, that makes sense. I guess I was thinking from the perspective of having multiple projects ongoing and all of them needing money. <laughs> so can you apply for two different projects and two different, you know, like the full grant may, you know, it may be for a project that needs a little bit more funds and the micro grant may be for another project that you need, you know, like you just need some supplies. So uh, in, in the logistical answer to that question, you cannot be the primary researcher for two projects at once. So that would be the only reason that can't work. However, if you're a collaborator with somebody else who applies on behalf of this project that supports multiple people's work, that would be absolutely fine. Um, if you're worried about the ability to have higher statistical chance of being awarded for a project, I would say that it does not necessarily help you to have more applications in the pool at once because the jury is also thinking about this person is, you know, in a sense, uh, spending more of our time looking at a series of their applications. And uh, it will change the way that they think about how competitive this project is against uh, several others that have essentially a smaller chance. But the um, the best way to deal with this is usually about understanding the timeliness of each project. Generally speaking, I find that when we've had a conversation about two things that are simultaneous and you're wondering which one or both can I apply for, we figure out that one has is more advantageous to apply for in this available round. Um, granted, one of the differences between the two uh, grants that we've discussed, but if you um, didn't arrive immediately or if you join the Zoom call later, you uh, must know that the micro grant is rolling. It can be applied for any time during the year. The jury grants um, are due on September 24th and February 12th, I believe. Um, and that usually has something to do with uh, the timeline that you imagine for your project and helps you think through also, can I get all the materials that I need? Can I contract the services that I need for this project feasibly by that deadline? So that's the kind of conversation we'll have. Also, I'll just say as a juror, I'd rather you make the choice. Of like, I don't want to sit there and look at 12 amazing project ideas of you and have to make the choice of which one I think you should be working on right now. Like, I think that's your choice of like, where are you at with these variety of things that you're doing? Um, and which one do you want to bring to us? Otherwise, I'm like, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like you'd be competing with yourself. Yeah. Yes. It's fine. Okay. 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 They're not here. I can't answer them, you know? What if I can't choose? Just <laughs> They're bigger problems. <laughs> what um, to the issue of uh, getting a mic full, is it possible? concept or it's the beginning 
I think is very helpful to the jury. Um, and and also if you get a micro, then we 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 see you, you know, like we see what's going on. You you get into like our ecosystem of support. And so then when you're applying for a full grant, we have more information, you know, like we have like, oh well, part of spent it on this and and you know, spin it documentation and like this is ready to go, you know, like that's helpful for you. Yeah, and we often treat the micro grants as very much that a stepping stone towards something larger. It's excellent to be able to see someone have foresight for their research. Just we say it seems like a micro would be really helpful. Do you want a micro? <laughs> and so sometimes we offer a micro when we aren't ready to offer. Any other questions? And of course, we're all around and people are able to, you know, spend a bit more time here. I think we're going to have everyone leave their room around 7 p.m. So you can talk to us more casually or if you would like to speak highly about their experience. Is there anything you want to add? I did. I just want to note that once you return, you give your receipts to Linda, they process very quickly. So if you're on top of your game, you make a nice Google, you know, Google Doc or Google folder and you drop all your stuff there, like the path is fast. If you just so it's not like you have to wait a long time, but if you forget, yeah, like you don't, you don't move through it, but if you want the money, the money will come to you. I think that's what I was hearing throughout this, yeah. but it's also, I can attest that it's true. But if you don't have your initial meeting with Linda, that money will not come quickly until you do that. Because there's just these like big, these hoops, her hoops. And, and Linda is so good at helping you navigate these hoops, but what, the position she's awkward, awkwardly placed in oftentimes with somebody coming and saying, I need this money tomorrow, or I need to pay this person three weeks ago, you know, and then and then she suffers the, the frustrated emailers that are like, oh my God, this person is paid yet. You know, like it, it takes like four weeks to get somebody in a system. Yeah. And that's just like the unfortunate way things are built, you know, like should it be that way? I don't know. <laughs> and I wasn't. Heidi is not just here because she was available. Um, Heidi is, in fact, the template for our receipt reimbursement form. Your Google Sheet became how we instruct everybody to send our materials. <laughs> yeah. This was our financial assistant, Carol Hernandez, and I made that based entirely off of your receipts from Senegal. Well, it's interesting because when you decide you want receipts in Senegal, like asking for a receipt is like the most insane request in that particular city. So I was like, then well, what do I do if there aren't, like you don't get receipt from the place. And, and Linda has been asked this question before. She is in her position because she has probably already said, well, I know exactly that shop in the car. <laughs> and there, you have to get it handwritten and tell him, you know. <laughs> Well, no, and, and that, so we can deal with certain gray areas. We can deal with handwritten receipts. We can deal with uh, receipts that were lost. Um, those things are not impossible to overcome. It is, of course, better to look at the requirements for documentation from procurement services. Things move faster. You get fewer suspicious emails from AP and NPS asking for details that you may or may not remember at that point. Um, but we will get you through that process. And Yours were not just handwritten or sometimes missing, they were also in other languages. And you did such a great job of contextualizing all of that that you got all your money back. The team that supports the projects that come through here are here because they want to be here. They want your wild, wacky problems. <laughs> you know, like they find this, you know, invigorating, interesting, problematic work. So, you know. Yeah, dog harmonica, bring that one back, right? <laughs> So many projects that just have so much more potential that we wish we could give them all the money that we have. Yes. Lawrence Shea. Yeah. No, no, you're not alone. This is about accessibility, not your ability to sing out. Okay. Okay. Uh, maybe you already answered this came in late. So, um, but what are the rules around paying other people, either students or people that aren't affiliated to the team? We did cover this before, but it never hurts to repeat it. You have to create a contract, a contract and a position with HR at CMU in order to pay somebody to do a service. 
And um, if the student, that means that you have to have that position created in order for them to log hours, they will only pay them if they log those hours for the work that they are doing. You cannot technically do it retroactively. Specific to the budget, and what happens if the expense and there's a discrepancy between the budget layout and the actual staff? It will never be the same as what actually happens, and we understand like we understand that your project can shift and change, and like you know, the things don't look exactly um, the same in your spending and in your actualizing of the project. Like you might even change your mind on some key elements of it. Major, major changes should be run through Linda and Harrison. You know, like, oh, I'm gonna bring 12 people and I'm gonna pay them all $12 instead of bringing one person, you know, um, like that kind of thing, you know, touch base. But the meeting you have with Linda will be a meeting about what your budget says, what you're going to do, how you're going to do it. You know, like I had a project where I was paying someone hourly to do some programming for me. And it was something that no one had ever done before. So I put it in, like, I think it'll take this many hours. It took way more because no one ever had done that before. So there's just some things that you won't necessarily know, but what was helpful is to say, I do know a programmer who I can at least start this project with because it's never been done before. But I do have a person's name who had some skills that we could start with. So that's that's what's helpful on a budget more than like, you know, this is this thing. And and the budget can also describe like to, to various eyes, like, why does that person think they need this to do? Like sometimes we see things where we're just like, that isn't necessary for what they're describing that they do. And so, you know, hopefully they've had a conversation with Harrison. Hopefully they've had a moment to consult and get those questions answered. And then Harrison doesn't know if they ask, they ask other people, you know. Um, but like that's the feasibility is what we're looking for, not exactactitude. You should make that really clear. What do you say about? Retroactively. I, I wanted to clarify um, something that we've seen before, and it made me think of it when I mentioned that you cannot pay students for work that they've already done uh, in, the, in the strictest sense of that phrase. Um, but also, in, in no circumstance will CMU allow you to be reimbursed for a service. This is something that we have looked at from every angle, and you simply cannot be reimbursed for a service only for goods. Um, it is a rule that's much higher than the, uh, the College of Fine Arts. It's something we can't. Um, so when in doubt, just ask. We're happy to help you. At no point are we going to try to curtail your plans. Um, I wanted to take one more moment to think if there's any questions that you wanted to ask that you, other people might benefit from hearing. But if not, we'd like to talk with you one-on-one. -on -one. And otherwise, just wanted to say thank you so much for coming all the way down to the studio on what must be the hottest day of this year. Thank you. Thank you.